continues this afternoon as we go into our next session. As I mentioned, we're going to be looking at science and technology breakthroughs and innovations this afternoon. And our first session is on just that, SciTech breakthroughs for biodiversity, agriculture, and health. So I'm going to invite our moderator, Crystal Orderson. She's the South Africa editor of the Africa Report, and she's a reporter for Jeune Afrique. And so I'll call Crystal to the floor and invite her to have her panelists join us. So thank you. Um, I know lunchtime is always a challenging time to actually get, you know, be motivated, listen, but I think the dynamic speakers that's on our panel this afternoon will certainly give some food for thought, give us some ideas, and we do know that there's no one-size-fits-all approach, and we've heard from different speakers the past two days, there's, you know, solutions can't be a one-size-fits-all approach, but I do think that our panelists have some very innovative ideas that they would like to share with us. But I think before I introduce, um, my esteemed um, panelists this afternoon. I just want to touch on, on two things that's come up over the past 24 hours in sub-Saharan Africa. At this very moment, um, in northeastern Congo, thousands of children under the age of five have been diagnosed with malaria. And what we have happening right now is that most of their parents cannot afford the treatment. We know there is treatment, but these parents in the northeast of Congo cannot afford it, and so children are dying. That's one element. The second one, in terms of food production in my own country, we're experiencing in South Africa the worst drought in years, and we're actually finding that people are starving and not able to eat at this moment. And it's not only happening in South Africa, it's also happening in Zimbabwe, in Ethiopia, and other countries in East Africa. And I think for me, those two issues raises the question in my mind, if we have technological advancement in these sectors, how can we save lives in healthcare? How can we feed our people? How can we feed nations? And I think the panelists today will touch on some of the innovations that they are doing in particular countries and some of the experiences. So um, our first speaker that I would like to introduce is Brandy DeCarly. She's the founding partner of Farm from a box. So um, I met Brandy and she was like, the first thing she said is, Crystal, I spent one year in South Africa in Limpopo working on a, on a gaming farm. And I was like, okay, she's been around the block. Um, so she's designed um, a farm system that's providing communities with tools and technology needed to increase local food production. Um, I heard that she's coming to South Africa in the next few weeks. So um, I'm sure the rest of the continent will also benefit from it. Welcome, Brandy. Our second speaker is also from an island, but um, um, the island of Zanzibar. I would like to um, you know, introduce Dr. Flower Msia. Um, she's a senior researcher at the Institute of Marine Sciences of the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And um, she's been working with women seaweed farmers, more than 300 women from 60 villages in Zanzibar. And she's gonna give us a perspective on what's happening with women and seaweed farmers. Our third speaker is Laura Gilbert, and he said I could say Larry Gilbert, because it sounds more American, but I'll prefer the French for Laura. Um, he's the director at L'Oreal, and he's done some fascinating work, but he said the latest sort of work that he's focusing on is developing methodologies on how to improve um, the environmental aspects of our products. Um, he's working with 2,000 women in Burkina Faso and some fascinating projects, and Gilbert Lauren is going to give us some interesting insights into some of the work that L'Oreal is doing. Thank you. And our last speaker is um, Evelyn Gitau. She's from the... Um, African Academy of Sciences in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, she's also the program manager for the Grand Challenge Africa Initiative, um, and she's responsible for the Bill and Melanie Gates supported activities. Welcome, Evelyn. So 
So this afternoon, our panelists have prepared some slides. So what we'll do is each panelist will give us a presentation and then we will engage with some questions and some questions from the audience. Thank you. Brandy? Hello, everyone. How are we doing after lunch? Good. Good, all right. Alive and well. We've got some energy going on. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure to be here. Thank you so very much. As we have heard throughout the entire forum, agriculture and climate change are inextricably linked. We cannot separate the two. Our changing climate really demands that we start re-examining what our current practices are and what the impacts are environmentally and socioeconomically of farming, because they are tied. Smallholder farmers and women are the absolute backbone of the agricultural sector, and yet they're almost the most underutilized resource that we have. Too often, smallholder farmers and the women that are doing the farming lack a reliable infrastructure to be able to support crop growth and be able to get a good value for the crop that they do grow. We see a massive opportunity here. We think that it's time to connect production and consumption and make sure that we are really providing the tools that smallholder farmers and women need to be able to grow their own crops on a local level and get a good value for it and shift our focus more from mass production to production by the masses. So this is what we have done. We've put an infrastructure in a box. Sounds like a relatively simple solution, but let me tell you a bit of what it includes. Um, farm from a box is a complete off-grid toolkit for sustainable farming. I'm really tall, so I'm going to lift this up so that I don't have to bend down any further. Um, so what we have done is we have put in an entire renewable energy system, a water system, basic tools, and training into one complete kit to be able to help stimulate local on-the-ground growth in rural areas. Each system, as you can see, has three kilowatts of solar panel energy on the top, has an entire drip irrigation system, and comes with all of the basic tools that you need to be able to support your own crop growth on a two-acre plot of land. One of the most important factors is we want to make sure that we're using clean energy technology to be able to foster reliable crop growth. So the solar panels power a pump that pumps the water out of a ground well system and moves the water evenly throughout the entire field. We also have a micro drip irrigation system, which we know at this point with erratic rainfall patterns and drought, as we're seeing throughout the world from California to Ethiopia, as has been discussed, can be very transformative for on the ground farmers to not only be able to produce more crop and extend the growing season, but be able to make sure that we're utilizing that resource of water very wisely. We've also included the basic tools that you need, water filtration system, a complete Wi-Fi connectivity in the box as well, so that information is also provided to the farmers on the ground so that they can get access to training and also market information so they can get a better price for what it is that they're growing. Now we do know that no two situations are gonna be exactly the same. There is no copy-paste solution that's going to work for absolutely everything. So what we have done is we've developed this system to act as a template that we can actually tailor to the situation on the ground and make sure that all of the technological components are fitting for the climate and for the users. Whether those users are a local women's farming cooperative or a school, or down to a, a refugee situation where we need to be really hyper-efficient with our growth. One of the things that we can really play around with is, sorry, I keep leaning, keep leaning over, um, a cool bot system it can actually be really important for mitigating post-harvest losses, but also can store vaccines and be able to really make sure that other, other enabling mechanisms are put onto the farm as well, so it extends beyond simply agriculture. Here's the pump that we're using and the Netafim system and in a complete IoT and information communication technology system as well so that farmers have the information at the access in their hands 
in the cloud so that we can really make some informed decisions. Now, we are not doing this alone. Instead, what we have done is we're working with partners that have already proven these things in the field. We've partnered with Netafem, the premier drip irrigation company out of Israel, to be able to provide those solutions. We've partnered with SMA to make sure that the entire inverter system and solar energy system is the most reliable one that we can actually put on the ground. Grunfoss, same exact thing when it comes to the work pumps. We want to make sure that everything that we provide in this system is going to last. Now, the most important thing is technology is one thing, but as Indra said earlier, education, 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 education. Technology is not a standalone solution. So we've also made sure that we have an entire training package that comes a part of this to make sure that we are training on sustainable farming techniques, technology use and maintenance, and also farming as an enterprise. Thank you. Whew, freedom. All right. And farming is an enterprise so that we can make sure, again, it's about value creation for the farmers in addition to crop production. So with this, I'd like to leave you with a thought of women smallholder farmers are a resource. They are a resource. What happens when we provide them with a the capacity to really localize food production so that not only are they growing food, but they're utilizing technology and they have the infrastructure and tools at their hands to make sure that it's grown sustainably, it's grown efficiently, it's grown with wise use of all of our resources, and they can really generate an income as a result as well. So I hope that all of these women and men that are in this room we collectively can build a new food system that is built with low carbon emissions and done with respect and dignity for everybody that's on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brandy. Um, I now call on um, Flower. I am a researcher with a passion to help rural women improve their livelihood. I have a mission to see that my research results are utilized by rural women to enhance their livelihood through improved agricultural production and value addition. In Tanzania, rural women cultivate a crop called seaweed in the ocean. When ocean water goes out, they go in and tend their farms. When the water comes back, they go home while carrying their seaweed harvest to dry in the sun. They sell dry seaweed as their cash crop. The method that these women use to cultivate seaweed is the peg and line of bottom method. In this method, the seaweed is tied onto nylon ropes using a thinner nylon rope called raffia. The ropes with the seaweed are stretched between wooden pegs and the seaweed is let to grow purely by using seawater for six weeks. When the six weeks are up, the seaweed is harvested, dried in the sun, and sold to export companies that ship it abroad to United States, France, and Denmark. Two types of seaweeds are farmed. One is called cotoni, and the other one is called spinosa. From these seaweeds, a gel is extracted and used in a number of industries such as food, cosmetics, and pharmaceuticals. Example, and, and this, uh, uh, the gel is used as a softener and a stabilizer. An example of such industrial products are body lotion and toothpaste that remain soft on use. So these two seaweeds are valued according to the type of gel that is produced from them. Cotoni sells at a price that is double that of spinosa. It sells at half a dollar per kilo of dry seaweed, whereas spinosa sells at 25 cents of a dollar. For the past close to 30 years, these rural women 
have used these, uh, have planted these two types of seaweeds. But unfortunately, in the last seven years or so, cottony is no longer growing in the shallow water areas where it is traditionally cultivated because of impact of climate change, including the increase in surface seawater temperatures and epiphytes. I want to help these women. So for the past 10 years, I have, I have worked with colleagues at my Institute of Marine Sciences to develop technologies for farming and value addition that these farmers can use. To do, th to do this uh, is aimed at the fact that if cottony cannot, gr cannot grow any longer in the shallow water areas, it can still be farmed in waters of two to five meters depth. For this, I have developed floating rafts made of nylon ropes and bamboo. The good results that we obtained from these rafts show that cottony can be farmed in the, shell, in the deep waters using the floating rafts. However, there is a catch. Deep waters means rough sea. Rough sea may break the seaweed and the farmers may lose their crop. To address this, last year I developed another technology for farming in the deep waters, which I call tubular nets. In, the, in this technology, the seaweed is placed inside the nets and is allowed to grow there. The nets minimize breakage due to rough sea. So far, so good. But there is another thing, though. If these women have to work in the deep waters to use these tubular nets, they have to either swim to the nets or they have to acquire large boats to reach the nets. Most of these women cannot swim. So to realize the potential of using tubular nets to cultivate the cottony, women must acquire boats and work with men in the deep waters. But my passion did not end there. I also developed technologies to make seaweed value-added products. I have trained women and men farmers in more than 30 villages to make seaweed value-added products such as cottony, and such as powder, soap, and body lotion. Also foods such as juice, jam, and, and cakes. So these rural women sell these products at higher return than what they get from, from farming the seaweed alone. To sum up, rural women in Tanzania can now use the tubular net method to cultivate the cottony in the deep waters and hence improve their livelihood. But also there's another technology that I developed. I te developed a technology of extracting the water from the seaweed that we call sap before the seaweed is, is dried. This sap is used as a plant growth stimulator. So these rural women can use the sap to, to improve the growth of their, their food crops and therefore they will improve their food income and their food production and also the income. This sap can also be sold as a commercial product so they get more cash income. So to sum up, I can say that these rural women can utilize the deep water tubular nets to cultivate cottony, working around the negative impacts of global warming. And by extracting the sap from the spinosum, they also add value to their seaweed harvest. So what can I say? My passion of helping rural women have indeed helped them to improve their livelihoods and put smiles on their faces. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Flower. I now call my esteemed colleague, Laura. It's okay. 
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you this afternoon and to, uh, to share with you, first, our, our commitment for a sustainable beauty and uh, second, some, uh, one example of innovations that, uh, that I will maybe reveal to you. You have probably, uh, all of you, you have seen that in your bag you have this uh, kind of my UV patch, this kind of uh, tip. Uh, just you, you will see what it is about. So if you have not opened it yet, it's good. Uh, I will explain what it is about and uh, how, how, to, how to use it. And for the one who have not the patch in, in, their, in their bag, so we have some, uh, some patches uh, outside, so we will be able to give you those patches afterward. So le let's start uh, saying that um, uh, we are uh, really uh, committed to, uh, to a sustainable beauty, and, and uh, it's not something which is new, but it is something which has been re reinforced and uh, very clearly by our CEO, Jean-Paul Agon, end of 2013, when he uh, launched our Sharing Beauty with All program, which is the uh, sustainability uh, uh, commitment of the L'Oréal Group. Uh, what, what is quite unique in this program is the fact that it covers the entire value chain of the organization from innovation, production, uh, living sustainably, and, and so the consumption, so sustainable consumption and sustainable development. Uh, I won't enter into the global presentation uh, uh, and we can share with you uh, our progress report and all the, the aspect of the project. What I would like to say about the project is the fact that what is at the heart of the project is uh, sustainable innovation. Because if we want to be sustainable tomorrow, we, want, we need to innovate and we need to make sure that we innovate for sustainability and we need to make sure that we innovate by sustainability, which, which are really the two aspects of it. And in doing so, in developing those aspects uh, based on life cycle analysis, we have identified that the main impact of our activity are really linked to the formula sourcing of the ingredients and end of life of the, of the ingredients. So that's why we are really working to minimize uh, the impact of our formula and uh, selecting the ingredients that we are using and our, our packaging. Uh, and when we are looking at the, uh, at the formulation and the ingredients that we are using, uh, we are using more and more ingredients which are coming from biodiversity, which are plant-based and vegetal-based. In doing so, we need to do it in a, in a way which is sustainable, and we have many programs of good agricultural practice fighting against deforestation just to make sure that we are really using those ingredients uh, and sourcing them in uh, the most sustainable way, and uh, good agricultural practices are very, very important for us to help uh, to, to help uh, growing, uh, growing those plants. And the way we are transforming them also, which is very important, uh, looking at, uh, at green chemistry. So that's about it, and we have many programs uh, in Africa. You mentioned about the, the work we are doing in Burkina Faso, and we are sourcing in Burkina Faso shea butter, and the program benefits to 20,000, so sorry, I, was, I missed one zero, 20,000 women in, in Burkina Faso, and we will continue to work with those communities because this is really the way, to, uh, the way to help, at the same time, the environment and also to uh, take into account the social aspect of it because it's really about helping also the integration and empowerment of women. And as we said, when uh, women are uh, empowered in those programs, the, the uh, resilience of those programs uh, uh, is much better than uh, when they are not involved. So this is something that we have observed on the, on the ground. If we, want to, uh, if we want to make the, those programs very efficient, we need also to, uh, to, to communicate and to uh, probably discuss with our consumers and share with our consumers this commitment in a very different way. And the digital, the digital world, the, what, everything which is happening in terms of digitalization is absolutely key also to, uh, to provide better services to put to, to, and to dialogue with our consumers in, in, a, in a very different way. And that's why we have created in San Francisco a, a tech incubator where we are developing new services for our uh, consumers. And that's why, uh, that's what I want to, um, to share with you today, which is coming from this tech incubator where they have developed this patch for La Roche-Posay and this, uh, this patch. And the, the reason why to develop this patch is the fact that 
probably a lot of you are using uh, sun care product when you are going to the beach. We are, we are well positioned for that. Huh? The, if you want to go to the beach tomorrow after the, uh, after the, the conference, please uh, use your, your sun care product to protect yourself. It's, uh, it's clearly very, very important. And even when you are not going to the, to the beach, uh, and when you are going to the beach, probably you don't know when to reapply the product. You don't know uh, if the product is still uh, still present, if you are still protected, and things like that. It's very difficult to, to know when you are really protected and so on. And even even when you are not uh, uh, in uh, on the beach, uh, when you are in uh, in Maurice, you are exposed to the radiation. And the World Health Organization recognizes that probably even in in the areas where UV exposure is quite low we are exposed to a point which could be damaging for your, for your health, for your skin, and you know that uh, UV damage can go from uh, fast aging uh, to skin cancer, so it's a, a real health issue, and, and that's something which is, uh, which is really important. So that's why we have created this patch that I wear here. So I don't know if you can see it, if you can zoom on it. So everybody was asking me why I, I had uh, an earth on my on my hand. It's probably because I'm a lovely person, but it's not. Uh, it's, well, it's, it's not exactly the. It's not exactly the reason. The, this patch is what you have in this uh, in this small bag. So if you open it, you you will have the patch, and you can apply it on the skin. The patch can stay up to five days on, on the skin, uh, so it's very comfortable, uh, very easy to uh, very easy to position. You can put it on the on the end, or but you can put it anywhere on the body. It will uh, it will stay. You can put your UV cream on it. You can take your shower with it without any difficulty. And what will happen? So when you are looking at the um, at the way it is, the patch, you can see that there is 18 square on the patch. So part of the squares are used as a reference, meaning that when you will take a picture of that, and I will show you just next after, just next slide, just after, I will show you. So when you will take with your application, with your smartphone, where, when you will take a picture of, the, uh, of this uh, of this earth, some of them will take as a reference, so meaning that whatever the, uh, uh, what, whatever the luminosity is, whatever the atmosphere you are in, it will always take the same kind of, uh, of photo. And some of them, so in fact six of them, are, include a dye, which is UV sensitive and will measure over time your exposure to, uh, to UV and will uh, measure if you are well protected with, uh, with your, uh, with your uh, sun care. So the way it works, it's go with an app, so which is uh, an app which name is My UV Patch. And on this app, so the app tells me that it is time to scan my, uh, my earth and you, you have the possibility to scan it to scan the earth. I won't do it, I won't do it right now. Uh, we need to be outside to do it because the luminosity is not good enough in the room to, to do it. But let me show you what I did because I put the earth Friday before, uh, before leaving. So I left Paris uh, Friday, uh, sa Saturday evening. So I put it on my skin Friday. As you can see, it's still there. Uh, two of the dots are turned red when they are on the sun. On the sun. And if you just look at the difference of, of sun exposure between Paris, huh, even though Paris is in spring, <laughs> and you can see so it's uh, the green light. And so it was very safe in Paris. In Mauritius, and you can see when I arrive in Mauritius, and Mauritius is not exactly the same. So just to say that I have not applied uh, UV, 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 uh, UV product, I should have. I should have. Because even if we are spending quite a lot of time here, we are, we are exposed and we should apply for, uh, for that. So wh why, it, why is it important to, to do uh, those, uh, those tools? It's very important because despite all the communication we can do with our consumers, uh, very complex to, to communicate with them. And those tools which are delivering a new service, a new experience to consumers, that's really a way to change their behavior and to change the way they are looking at, the, at their product. And what I would like maybe to propose is to discover it in a short video. If you, if you can launch the video. UV rays cause considerable skin damage. It is therefore essential to adopt the most suitable sun protection for one skin type and for the dose of UV rays received. To protect people better, their exposure to the sun should be measured. For this reason, L'Oreal has created My UV Patch, the first ever flexible electronic UV sensor. 
This ultra-thin patch sticks to the skin and accurately analyzes the UV radiation received by the body, with and without sunscreen. The color variation in the blue squares measures in real time instant and cumulated UV doses over several hours or even days. It informs the wearer when UV protection is insufficient. Developed by L'Oreal's Connected Beauty Incubator with the company MC10 for the brand La Roche-Posay, it offers a fully customized recommendation for better use of sun protection products. La Roche-Posay will be distributing 1 million patches free of charge around the world. My UV Patch is a service offered free to the consumer, combining technology with health protection. So this is something which is very important for La Roche-Posay. Huh? The, the mission of La Roche-Posay is a better life for sensitive skin, so really working on, on this area and the ability to launch, to launch this uh, UV patch uh, on, on a global basis, as you can see, with one million patches that will be distributed is something important. And you are very lucky because this is the first, I would say, large display of patches that we have done. You, you are the first one to, to, to receive it. So you can go on the Apple Store, so it, it will be uh, available not in every country uh, right away, but in, 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 in some countries, and it will, it will grow over time. But you can go to, to download the app and to, to test and to, to start using it. Thank you. Thank you, Laurent. I'll be getting my patch soon. And our last speaker is Evelyn. Good afternoon. So I'm going to switch gears a bit, but I'm not going to talk about a technology, but I'm going to talk about what we're doing in trying to fund innovators on the continent. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to do this today. So I'd like to start by celebrating the amazing African women innovators we have in this room today, starting with my fellow panelist, Flower. Um, Winnie Akini Nyonde, who talked yesterday. We heard from Jill Farrant via video. Saganet Kalamu, Her Excellency President Amina Gurib Fakim, and all the women on the continent who are spearheading STEM innovations in Africa. We need more women like these in STEM to ensure that Africa achieves her development agenda. So again, just let's give them a really big hand because they're doing a really great job. It is really important for these women to be doing this because in Africa, women continue to con um, face very many challenges. While the ratio of women to men in Africa is almost equal, women have less opportunities compared to men. Challenges such as sexual harassment, poor sexual and reproductive health, illiteracy, lack of power to make decisions prevent women from fully participating in economic empowerment and development. And sadly, according to World Bank estimates, the rate at which girls and women die relative to men on the continent and in other low and middle income countries is much higher. To quote Nyadzarai Gumbonzwanda, former general secretary of the YWCA, a society cannot make progress if slightly more than half of its population is not part of the development agenda. In 2015, the African Academy of Sciences, where I work, partnered with NEPAD to launch the Alliance for Accelerating Science in Africa, whose mission is to close the research gap between Africa and the rest of the world. The initiative's mission is to drive Africa's research and development agenda and to build scientific capacity across the continent. To do this, AISA has five programs, and amongst them, the first one is DELTAS, which is Developing Excellence in Leadership, Training, and Science in Africa. This program is a $100 million program, which is investing in supporting 11 programs on the continent that are building research capacity across 21 countries on the continent. The next one is the Climate Impact Research Capacity and Leadership Enhancement Program, CIRCLE. And this is a $7 million program supported by the DFID, that has um, so far supported 63 fellowships to Africans working in climate impact research on the continent. And I'm proud to say that of those 63 fellows, half of them are women. 
the program I lead is the Grand Challenges Africa initiative that was mentioned. This program is particularly supporting innovators who innovate and provide solutions for challenges that may hinder Africa from achieving um, sustainable development goals related to health. So we are supporting um, innovations that um, address health challenges in Africa. The Academy has decided to strategically support women in, with intent. So to do this, we are doing a couple of things. Um, the first one is we have proposal development workshops for women. The main reason we're doing this is because out of the applications we have um, received for proposals, only 20% of them are coming from the African women. So we think by encouraging women to attend a proposal development. Okay. Um, thank you. So um, by doing uh, proposal development workshops for women, we hope to encourage more applications to increase them from 20% to higher rate. Um, secondly, we'd like to increase the quality of um, proposals being brought to women to ensure success in, the open, in an open and unbiased selection process because it is in excellence that we want to achieve women driving science in Africa, not reducing the quality. Um, as I look around this room, I think my, our target of creating mentorship for women by women in Africa is not going to be too difficult for us now because we have a class of, um, quality class of women here in this room. And thirdly, for all the projects that we are funding, we encourage gender parity. And where they're not achieving this, we're actually um, giving them funds to see how they can recruit more women into their programs. So we ask them to report how many women they're recruiting for PhDs and postdocs and hope and ensure that they're keeping up to the 50% gender parity. So Grand Challenges Africa was launched in 2015 to support African innovations for African challenges. Um, initially, we are supporting, and on the left I have a, a, um, a map which shows what our partners have done in the last 10 years. Our partners being the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Grand Challenges Canada, which is supported by the Canadian government, and USAID. They have um, supported 380 innovations on the continent um, in the tune of about $120 million, um, dollars, and $20 million and in 21 countries. So what we're doing there is taking some of those existing innovations to see how we can help them scale up to, um, um, to, to, to bigger and greater things by partnering them with um, private and public partnerships. We're also recruiting a global network of like-minded partners to fund and shape the future of Grand Challenges Africa. The themes that we're focusing on are uh, cross-cutting. In October of this year, our first call will go out and we'll invite proposals on scientific innovations that will improve maternal, neonatal, and child health in Africa. These will include solutions, that, um, solutions to negative impacts of climate change on maternal, neonatal, and child survival, and clean energy to reduce the effects of pollution on respiratory health in children. Importantly, we're partnering with the Gates Foundation to ensure that we put women and children at the center of development by encouraging innovations for women and with women, by incorporating women of knowledge in solutions for challenges that directly affect women and children. As I close, I would like to encourage all the amazing women and men who are here today to partner with us to mentor women led enterprises and encourage young women to take up leadership positions to drive the research agenda in Africa. I would like to thank the leadership at the African Academy of Sciences for allowing me to come here and NEPED who continue to give us great support and our financial backers, the Gates Foundation, the Trust, UKID. We've partnered with Institute Pasta and Grand Challenges Canada for our first call and the Women's Forum for supporting me to come here. Thank you. Thank you very much to my four um, dynamic panelists. Um, we're hoping to have a bit of a conversation um, by engaging with some of um, the issues raised. Brandy, I'll start with you. Um, I like the concept of mass production to production for the masses. Can you give us some, you know, sort of practical examples of how um, 
you know, some of the lessons learned um, of the rollout of the project in the US and how that, you know, is going to guide you when you eventually, we know you're in Ethiopia and you're planning to, um, to come to South Africa. Because we often know that whilst technology can be very empowering, technology can also be disempowering, especially in some parts of the continent. Yeah, exactly, and that's, that's a really wonderful comment. Um, technology has the power to really be an enabling mechanism. And at the same time, as technology is really growing and developing exponentially, there is the risk of leaving populations behind and sort of furthering the divide of inequity that can happen in certain areas. So I do think that it's extremely important to make sure that there is equitable access uh, to technology that can really be transformative uh, across the entire board and make sure that we're bridging that gap, make sure that communities do have access to different technologies and systems that can really build the resilience on the ground. In terms of learned lessons, there have been many. There have been many. And I think it's very easy to just tech up a solution for the sake of teching up a solution, but it has to be appropriate technologies to make sure that it's really fitting with what the ultimate goal and the need is on the ground. Otherwise, we could just run the risk of overcomplicating things. Um, so keeping it simple, and making it really applicable and tailored to the situation on the ground is, I think, where it's going to be the most impactful. Thank you. Flower, fascinating project. But I, I, I was sitting here and I was listening and I thought, that's quite labor intensive. Um, also, weather patterns change. As we heard that some of the women can't swim. You know, it takes up to six weeks um, in terms of the process. So how do you think technology can actually reduce that labor-intensive period spent by the women. Is there a way to do that? Uh, with, with seaweed, um, first of all, the, the, the six weeks for growth is for the gel to reach the required uh, quality of the market. So the seaweed has to be grown for, for six weeks. But when we talk about the, the technology itself, uh, when we talk about the, the, when we talk about women cannot swim, I think that uh, the the technology can still help these women to, to 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 work in the deep waters when appropriate technologies are developed. When we develop a technology that still has some challenge for the women, then we go to a second step to look at how will we really implement this technology so that it will be useful to, to the women. So I think that technology still has a lot of, of, of importance in this. And the technology that you, the, the one we are talking about, tubular nets, is the first technology that the seaweed has really been cultivated in, in deep waters. But if we explore more, we will get even other technologies that can help more these women to do their work. So I think Technology really is, is important in this. Just a follow-up question, Flower. Can we roll out that particular project to Mauritius, to Comor, to Reunion? Is, it, is that possible? Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. Because uh, uh, when we have, as long as there's the, the shallow water area, and this shallow water has to be sandy, not muddy, and the, 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 the water has to be really clean, not with particles. I'll give an example. I, actually, I, was, I came to Mauritius in 2011, and uh, I was told to train the people on how to farm seaweed. And uh, I, I trained the people uh, here in, in this, uh, on this island and then on, in Rodrigues about farming. So I think that uh, as long as you have these shallow waters, the water goes out. It has to go out. If it doesn't go out, the seaweed will not grow. And then uh, you have the sandy bottoms. You don't have mud, you don't have uh, clay, you don't have uh, particles on the, on the water. The water is clear. Then seaweed can be, can be farmed, this type of seaweed we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And if, if you don't have the shallow waters, you can still farm in the deep waters as long as you have an appropriate technology to do so in the deep waters. Thank you. Laura, you know, interesting presentation. But I often, when I speak to scientists, to innovators, they always tell me that you know, money is essential. If you don't have money and the sort of resources, you're unable to get your idea to the marketplace. Now, you in charge, obviously, of a very powerful portfolio. Um, you decide ultimately uh, play a role in what are we, what the market is going to see. Um, can you talk us through just the process of, 
you know, in terms of the period of innovation to what we see now today that you showed us the patch. How long was that process and can we expect other innovations in the coming years from, from your company? Yeah, it will um, it will depend, and it is it's an excellent question because even ourselves we are asking the question the way it happened. You you know that uh, those kind of project, uh, the, the one of the UV uh, the UV patch, uh, I, I remember that uh, we were working on similar ideas five to six years ago, uh, but the technology was not uh, uh, enabling enough uh, to make it happen. So, so this is something that we have restarted in the, in the tech incubator and it, take, it took less than one year to do it. So uh, as, you, as you can see, uh, why I'm, I'm giving those two figures, because it, it's really depending on, uh, on the technology, if the technologies are available, is it also the right time uh, for the consumers uh, to, uh, to do that? Uh, so well, so ju just to, to, gi to give this kind of idea, so cl clearly, Money is, is, a, is an obstacle, but it's not the, the obstacle. I think that what is the obstacle is uh, ideas, to have the right idea and to be able to realize it in the best, in the best possible way. Uh, so obviously, you need money, you need resources, you need mm. competencies, obviously. Mm. But wha what is much more important is uh, the ability mm. to have the, 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 the ideas that will really respond to, uh, to a need and to believe on your idea. Huh? So Julius wa was saying that yesterday, it, was, it has been said, yeah, don't, don't predict the future, invent it. And, mm. and, so, yeah. uh, and you, you really need to, to put your level of ambition uh, and, and to trust that you have the right ideas, okay. that you understand what the consumers are needing, and, and to understand what consumers are needing or what the planet is needing, it's just asking it. Uh, that's really a, okay. a lot of effort. And when you have that, just go and, and it will work. So, Laura, would Flowers Project be a commercially viable example? Why, why not? We, we have to so see. There we so go, that, people. Yeah, yeah. We heard. Yeah. I think that the, the, the two presentations were extremely important for me on the way to do farming, on, on some innovations on, the, on, on materials. So I think that both are quite interesting. So we will, uh, we will pursue. I think it was good to come and to do a little bit of travel to come and to, to, meet, to meet you. Thank you. Evelyn, the past... 48 hours we've heard education, education, education is so vital. Um, clearly you're sitting on a powerful pocket of a gold mine, so to say. But often, um, you know, on my, st on my travels and stories, um, the girl child is often neglected because it's great that we are supporting our women scientists and that we see the end product. Um, but if we actually don't start from grassroots levels, are we going to see those women? Are they, do you, in your plans, are we looking at roll out in specific countries perhaps to see the girl child forming part of that science pool that eventually will be the next L'Oreal um, Young Scientist? Well, um, thanks for the question. Actually, um, some of the innovations we support are social innovations and I can actually think of one in Kenya that was particularly targeting the girl child to improve how girls learn science and to keep girls in school. So it's been found in many regions in Africa that girls who take sciences actually stay in school. So there's a build up to encourage girls to take sciences because it, we don't know what the correlation is, but they seem to stay in school and finish high school. Um, another social innovation that's been working, and I, I don't know if any of you are familiar, is um, um, a lady called Zana Africa. So her innovation was a scientific technology for cheap pads, um, sanitary pads. And what she's done is she's rolled those out in three, school, um, three countries in East Africa. And where girls were missing um, a week every month from school, and that was leading to higher dropout rates, they're finding that actually in the schools where they had almost 50% dropout for girls, when they introduced a sanitary pad program, 
all the girls are actually graduating from high school. So that's a really great social innovation. So we, we, when we look at the innovations that we're talking about, especially for the girl child, it's a, a scientific innovation that you can put into a business model as well as have a social impact. If you integrate those three things, especially for the girl child, it has shown and it has been proven that it actually works. Absolutely, and we often find that sexual health issues are often swept under the carpet because it's not sexy enough to talk about it. So thank you very much. So um, we've heard now from our panel some of the innovations happening, um, and who knows, next year we might see an amazing uh, project from Flower that um, Laurent is funding and funding Brandy as well. And Evelyn is here, so we know that there's future innovators sitting here. I'm going to open up to the floor for one or two questions to engage with our panelists. Can we get some mics, please? So we'll do um, one, two, three questions. What do you want me to start over here? Thank you. I don't know if it works, you have to turn it on. Okay. You can. Oh, okay. Um, can I come back to the education, education, education? I'm, I'm an educationist. Um, language. When we talk about so um, social capacity impact on the thing, the science information is here, the end user is there. So how are you addressing the language problem? I mean, the scientifics are going to be probably in English and French, but the end users are in which language? So is, is the, I mean, is the project financing any uh, language adaptation uh, issues at all? I mean, that's a good point and we've been only thinking about, we've been talking about um, diversity and how we address diversity at a language level. For us, of course, the solution right now is looking closer to, I mean, if you looked at the map, Francophone Africa is already left out because of issues of not having access to the material that we have. But uh, Lusophone and then even local languages. Um, there are some really great projects that have um, active community engaging, um, engagement programs so that when they're rolling out their programs, they're actually translating everything into, I, I think of um, some, some, language, uh, some projects in, in Nigeria, in Kenya, where they, they're actually using local languages. So on the coast in Kenya, for example, they use the local languages to actually educate the girls. But then what we found that is some of the girls actually want us to engage with them at, um, in our language so that we can actually get them to enhance their level of um, education. So it's a f we, we, they are community engagement programs that we have and we are trying to see how we fit a budget into, so the first phase we give 100,000 and give you two years for your um, innovation to give pilot data, but we are thinking of adding 10,000 on top of that for community engagement programs that would basically enhanced um, um, language engagement, ETC. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm looking at the policy makers in this room. <laughs> because um, unfortunately, and, and as you say, I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist, and I've actually started having to learn to speak English again because scientists don't speak English, <laughs> so I've been told. But, but the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, until the AU start thinking about how they break those barriers and, you know, in countries like um, in East Africa, for example, most countries do speak Kiswahili, but it's not the local language. We have, in Kenya alone, 47 local languages. How do we go about fixing that? So it's, it's, it's a very tricky situation. We have a school that's decided to teach all the children in Kiswahili, but the, they don't have the material to teach science properly, to teach other you know, skills properly. So especially for me, science has to be taught in the right language for children to excel in it. So it would be great if we had material it's proper science material in Kiswahili to teach science, then maybe we could definitely push the language barrier. But as a scientist, I, we, don't have, we don't have the material. I'm not writing chemistry books in Kiswahili, so it's not gonna happen. Thank you, Evelyn. So perhaps there might be an innovation idea coming out from here, relating to language as a pilot project perhaps, Evelyn? 
I mean, I should add, there is a technology for Braille, um, for deaf and blind people that is really, really working well and enhancing science in, um, in, in, in people who are deaf and who don't um, speak because, and so that's a language barrier that is being addressed by technology. Um, question at the back from, yes. I think, the Mauritian. Good. Good afternoon. Yes, Jacqueline Sozier from the Chamber of Agriculture. I'm here. <laughs> um, I really like this project of Farm from the Box because I'm promoting here a project on sustainable agriculture and agroecology. And um, that solution for small farmers will be very much interesting here. But I'd like to know, we mentioned, um, the person from L'Oréal mentioned funding and things like that. You've obviously developed relationship with guys from pumps, from irrigations, from technology and all that. How would it work for farmers elsewhere from the USA to be able to have the opportunity of having the process that you've already brought forward? It's always not necessary to reinvent what has already been invented. How would, would it be possible to translate what you've already put forward to other countries? Yes. Uh, first and foremost, agroecological approaches, I'm completely with you. I think that that's so important for our, our resilience across the board. When it comes to the technology, what we are taking in terms of the approach right now is we wanted to specifically partner with organizations that were all over. We did not want to be in the situation where there was one part that could only be replaced by a Canadian company and suddenly when something breaks down, there's, there's no replacement access. So we specifically tried to make sure that we had partners and different components that were pretty global and worldwide and, and easily recognized. Now with that said, it also comes down to the templated structure where we can plug in and plug out different components and different technologies and different makers as it is appropriate. Uh, I think one of the important things that we want to make sure that we do also is localize things as much as we possibly can so that it's not a single solution coming from one country, uh, but that it actually works for the local area. But, but I, I would love to explore it here. Yes, definitely. But how would it work for funding? Do we, does the, the country needs to buy the technology or something like that? Oh, did I completely miss your question then? <laughs> um, let me reroute on that one then. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is, Tailoring this solution towards certain, certain farmers, they're not going to be able to afford it, even though it can really be a catalytic mechanism for them to really better their livelihoods. So the original intention with Farm From a Box was to have this act as an alternative to standard food aid. So that rather than short-term food aid, short-term food aid, instead you provided a community with the tools that they needed to be able to grow and sustain their own crop production. So I think what we want to be able to do, and such has been the process so far, is work with governments, NGOs, and private sector to be able to do shared financial schemes to be able to make it appropriate. Okay. Um, one last question from... Franchette Gaspar Pialui from Rodrigues Regional Government. In fact, it's not a question, but I would like to share the experience of Rodrigues. When in, 2000, in the year 2000, there was a research that proved that if the local authority in Rodrigues don't take appropriate decision, the octopus in the lagoon would be an extinct creature by 2015. So what happens, uh, some years later, the local government took the decision to have, to, uh, have a closure Donc, the closure of the octopus season, where at the, at, in 2000, in, in, by 2000, we had only two, 100 tons of production of octopus per year. And uh, by 2000, after two closures, two years, we are now having uh, six, 600 tons of octopus. And also, we had to take the decision to relinquish the fishermen. And uh, the fact is that we had 2,000 fishers in Rodrigues, among which 50% women. And what we had to do is to try to see what are the alternatives that we can do. We have to empower the women so that they can earn their living because they were relying on the sea. And one of the projects, the Mauritius Research Council, the National Institute here, they made a research on the production of seaweed. And in fact, some of the women have been empowered to work with seaweed, to, to cultivate seaweed, and also to have processing of the seaweed. 
And today, so what they are doing, they are mixing seaweed and octopus, for example, to have pickles. They are mixing seaweed and bitter gourd to have pickles, which the Mauritian people enjoy. Also, what we have been doing in the relinquishing of these uh, uh, fish, fishes, or these women fishes, we have been uh, empowering them to, to have a family farm project. And in these projects, this uh, will help us to reach the objective of, to, uh, by 2030, to produce bio uh, product in Rodrigues. So all these uh, initiatives, but what I would like to, to, to say also is that we have had the financing of uh, international institutions, the Australian embassy, for example, has uh, come with us and financed the Octopus Pots project, that is technology, bringing technology in the uh, production of octopus. And what I would like is to invite Mrs. Flower to come to Rodrigues so, so that she can share with us what, sh what uh, she is doing in her country and how we can help these women to go further. And also maybe uh, the last point is to point out the importance of research and technology in the development of enterprises. So for long, Rodrigues have a good reputation of having good products. And last, last year, the, Her Excellency, the President, came to Rodrigues and she has been working for some time on the Rodrigan products. One among them is the Rodrigan lemon. And they have been doing some research and what we have seen is that the Rodrigan lemon has got a very good high potential to be, uh, so there are new products that can be derived and that can be used for cosmetics. And this is a great uh, thing for Rodrigue. This will enhance the production of lemon and this will encourage the planters also to go back to their land. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that I have a very strict program manager and I've been told that our time has come to an end. So thank you very much to my very four powerful speakers. Um, this was, you know, absolutely interesting from a journalist perspective. I'm sure the audience enjoyed it. And please, you know, network and who knows the ideas that will be born from this room. Thank you very much. Crystal for that. We'll be seeing you again later. I really like where this conversation is going. and We're going to keep going on that, certainly on the innovation side. And we'll pick up a little bit on what you were just starting to do, which was like, I've got an idea. Oh, I've got a solution. I've got this. I've got that. We'll, we'll come back to that.